seminar. Uh, for those of you in EMBA who are here joining us, welcome. Uh, we have a couple of these a term. It's an opportunity for the faculty members to present either a single paper or a set of papers or their work to the rest of the faculty and the, and the school. And I'm thrilled that the EMBA class came out to hear about Thomas's work on the changing landscape of entrepreneurial finance. Um, Thomas joined us this year uh, after a career at UBC and before that at Stanford. Uh, and is, uh, Thanks very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. What I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a little bit about a research agenda. So rather than focusing on one specific paper, I'm going to try to focus on a set of ideas. And some of those have resulted in papers. Some of them are work in progress. I'm also going to apologize because when Felix came to me a couple of weeks ago, um, I said, well, I've got some really preliminary stuff that's not ready for showing, and I've got some of the broader research agenda that overlaps with what I talked about when I gave a seminar a year ago. And so I am going to draw on some of that material, so I apologize for some of you in the room who will have seen some of, some of this material before. But I'll try to give actually a slightly bigger perspective, and there are some definitely some developments in the research that um, I can share with you. So. Just by means of background, um, I've had the pleasure of studying the venture capital industry for about 20 years. Uh, 20 years ago, very few people were studying this, and then came something called the dot-com bubble, and then came the dot-com burst. And actually, in 2002, when the whole sort of stock market collapsed, I thought I would have to go back and study something really boring like banking or something like that. <laughs> but you know, thank God that didn't happen. Um, because the entrepreneurial landscape keeps changing. And so what I want to share with you is a research project that I've been doing. And then I'll also be sharing with you some of the thoughts on how I think the environment for funding for startup companies is developing. I am so the Felix gave me a choice. And he said, look, you can do the range of fully academic with proofs of second derivatives and you know, statistical um, details. Or you can go do a very general um, overview that's much more accessible to a broad audience. And I'm probably going to be sort of one quarter um, you know, academic, three quarters general. And I'll occasionally try to show you where the academic challenges and depth comes in. But I'm going to try to make this a very accessible presentation so that everybody can um, readily follow. At the same time, that means that I very much hope that you're going to ask questions. I don't particularly like talking for an hour and a half. Um, so please ask questions as we go along. There's no reason to wait for questions until the end. So basically, the world that we used to live in and that um, I, I, I sort of, when I started my career, people thought of entrepreneurs going to venture capital and eventually generating some kind of a successful exit event. And this world has changed quite a bit. So the brave new world of entrepreneurial finance has a lot more intermediate steps today, where entrepreneurs may say go to an accelerator first. These days, they might be launching a crowdfunding campaign. They're going to go and find some angel investors before ever reaching venture capital. And hopefully, there's still some kind of an exit at the end of it. So who are the new kids on the block? They're basically accelerators, crowdfunding, and angels. And we have only begun to appreciate the significance that these new institutions have on how startup companies are funded and how they grow. So I want to talk about these new kids in town. And you know, I'm very interested in all three of those. But I'm really going to focus today on the angels. And I'm going to share my research with that. Not because I think that accelerators and crowdfunding are less interesting. I can say a few things about that. But it's basically a data issue where getting data on any of this is incredibly challenging. And <coughs> I'm going to be leveraging some opportunities of data that I have on angel investors. So who are these? Um, and I think by far the biggest new kids in town in terms of numbers, in terms of activity. Accelerators are relatively minor. They don't invest a lot of money. They probably have a bigger role in developing managerial talent and ideas. 
but you know, um, there's, in terms of money, the amounts are very small. Crowdfunding, well, in the UK, equity crowdfunding is working well. In the US, we're still waiting for the SEC to come out with clearer rules, so there's only angel list for accredited investors. So the amounts are not that big, whereas the amounts of angel investing are huge. Um, it also turns out that the angel community, and this is something I'm, I want to share some insights with you, is quite diverse. There isn't, we're using the term angels to denote, let me maybe define the term angels. Angels are essentially private individuals investing their own or their own families' uh, money. They are different from venture capitalists who are intermediaries who are investing money on behalf of some other, typically institutional investors. However, within that angel community, we have a huge diversity. We have people who essentially consider angel investing their professional activity. We've got networks, we've got funds. On angel lists, we've got these syndicates, we've got individual angels who invest a lot, who invest a little. And we know very little about that diversity in, within the angel community. Does it matter? So here's a little bit of research, then you don't have to read the exact numbers. But in an OECD study um, a few years ago, Karen Wilson and her, her team tried to estimate globally the amount of angel capital. Now, she will be the first one to say this is a huge amount of guesswork because we can't really see the angel investments. But the key conclusion that she basically found is that the amount of invested in the angel market are extremely similar to those of the venture capital market. So we have a visible or fairly visible venture capital market that we've been studying for 20 years. And parallel to it, there's an angel market that's just as big and we know almost nothing about it. So this is what I call the tip of the iceberg problem, which is we see a tiny little bit of angel investing. We see it when we see maybe a couple of very vocal super angels. These are people who essentially run uh, their own money or little angel fund and make their information very public. Dave McLure, 500 Startups is maybe the most famous of those, and a few others. And we've got you know, a variety of angel groups and networks, including at Oxford, we have our own ISIS um, angel network. Those you have a chance of observing a little bit about. But below the surface is, we believe, a huge number of common angels and angels who are explicitly hiding, who do not really want the world to know too much about what they're doing. And so this poses a real problem for anybody who would like to do research, because how do we get to the bottom of the iceberg? Well, here is Vancouver. Um, this is a shot that I took myself from a helicopter, so I'm rather proud of it. <laughs> um, and some people in the room will appreciate the beauty of this. Um, the study that I'm going to show you and the data I'm going to show you comes from British Columbia, of which Vancouver is the largest town. And British Columbia, by essentially a historic fluke, had a government program that happened to subsidize venture capitalists and angels along very similar lines. Many countries, many states within the US have some version of equity capital programs. By and large, they only help venture capital funds. The two notable exceptions are the UK, which has um, a, a, a very large program that's accessible to angel investors, and I would love to get my data on my hands on the data, and British Columbia, which has this um, for you know 15, 20 years had a tax credit that also applies to angel investors. How does it work? you get literally a 30% check in the mail. It's called a tax credit, but it's actually just you invest the money, you prove that you've made the investment, you get 30% of your investment back in the mail, irrespective of whether you actually owe taxes or not. So it's a bit of a misnomer. They basically can't call it a subsidy because that's not a politically correct word. Um, you have to be a BC resident and you have to invest in a BC company. And then there are various caps and restrictions um, but the most interesting thing is there are different programs. There's a program for venture capital funds. There's going to be a program for angel funds I'm going to talk about. And then they have a program for essentially individual angels. This was basically um, you know, a unique opportunity. I've got to th thank the investment capital branch of the government of British Columbia because they made the data available. 
And basically the deal was we did a report for them and I only did the report if they like, gave me access to the data. Um, that may or may not have been a good choice because that was about five years ago and we're still cleaning the data. Um, the amount of data work is, is, is phenomenal and they not, most of it was on paper and um, incomplete. But that's my problem, not yours. So let's talk about angel investors. There's a long history of categorizing angels. Um, this is our friend Hildegard von Bingen. And, you know, my co-author suggested we use that categorization, but it didn't work for me. Um, it, it's very nice, but no, we can't work like this. So we're going to categorize investors ourselves. And I'm going to share just a little bit of raw data before I get into the more analytical parts, because I think it's quite interesting. There is an amazing diversity of investors, and we really didn't know before this um, research program how complex and how many strange investors there are in this world. Definitely founders, managers, and employees, and we're going to deliberately take them out of the analysis. We're not looking at that aspect. We're going to look at external investors. We have family in the data. Now, it turns out that you, know, you don't always know exactly who's family, but we can identify people on the basis of having the same last name or the same address. That's a good proxy, it's not perfect, and we're not going to get all family members this way. We're then going to have individual angels. Um, we're going to have angel vehicles, which we're not going to really use for this paper, but we're going to use angel funds. So what's the difference between individual angel and an angel fund? Well, in an angel fund, you're creating a legal entity that aggregates investments of individuals, typically with a fund manager that has sort of uh, leadership role in actually making the deals. The reason these angel funds are really interesting is they, they sit squarely between our, they sit squarely in the gray zone between angels and venture capitalists. Because the traditional definition is angel invest his or her own money, venture capitalists invest essentially other people's money. Angel funds are an intermediary Yet, for all practical purposes, people think of them as angels because it is private individuals who invest in a fund structure that is very different from the traditional venture capital structure. They typically have no management fee. They have um, um, all of the things that my colleague Ludwig Falipu has been criticizing for his life in terms of the inefficiencies of the venture capital model. None of them exist in the angel world, essentially. So that's um, probably a, a bonus. They all also run not, uh, they get their money not from institutional investors, but from private individuals. And for the purpose of British Columbia, they actually collect a tax credit that essentially goes to the individual, not to any entity. Okay, we've got then various types of venture capitalists. It turns out there's a really interesting distinction in the venture capital world between government-backed venture capitalists and private venture capitalists. In other work, I've actually spent a lot of time analyzing that, and so I'll just make a little detour. Um, most people think that government, well, most economists have a prior belief that anything that the government does is bad, therefore government venture capital must be worse than private venture capital. Um, that belief turns out to be not entirely correct, and so we have a whole different line of research in which we're trying to compare the performance of government versus private-backed um, venture capital. There are various subcategories to worry about, but the long and short of it is that on their own, if government venture capitalists invest on their own, they tend to have poor performance. But in syndication with private venture capitalists, actually perform as well, if not better, than private venture capitalists on their own. We also find that their effect seems to be mainly explainable as leveraging investments in the sense venture capital tends to, as, as additional syndicators, throw more money into deals that are led by private venture capitalists. In Canada, it gets even more complicated because that's one of the countries where the government venture capitalists really underperform relative to the private market because there's a particularly badly conceived structure of how they subsidize government venture capital. So we're going to have that in the data as well. And then all the weird stuff happens. Clearly, we have universities who invest, typically in return not for cash but for 
intellectual property, but a little bit of cash too. We've got all sort of various um, corporate investors. Um, so let me show you a little bit of data here. If we're just counting different types of investors, we're counting the number of investors that you have in your company, angels completely swamp the landscape. 78% of all investors in these companies, now this is a, essentially a sample of startup companies in British Columbia, 78% of the investors are angels. Now this is not dollar weighted, so the next picture gives you probably a more accurate a dollar weighted picture, but still what we find is that individual angels are actually the largest category accounting for 29% of the funding, um, angel funds and then these angel vehicles which for the purpose of the analysis, we're going to lump together with individuals, account for another 20%. Venture capital is 23% corporations. So if we want to understand angels, you know, we're looking at more than half of the money and by far the largest number of investors. How do they invest? So here we're going to give you some, some basic descriptive statistics before I go into, you know, a lot of the, uh, more detailed analysis. Clearly, angel, individual angels invest much smaller amounts. 28,000 Canadian dollars. It used to be roughly the same as a US dollar. That's unfortunately no longer true. Um, 41,000 um, over their entire portfolio. So in fact, a lot of the angels only have one investment. Um, in fact, the, the overwhelming data, the, the majority of angels write one check, which is not the way we read about angel investors in the press, because they get no attention because they're so diffuse. But the majority of angels write one check. Then the angel funds and uh, some of these vehicles, they, uh, the vehicles are used often by more sophisticated angels. And so they often angels who invest in multiple deals, and we're going to isolate them later in a, very explicitly. They tend to have you know, much bigger portfolios, over a million dollars in portfolios, over 100,000 in a company. And that becomes, uh, now obviously, the venture capitalists are an order of magnitude bigger. These venture capitalists, on average, invested over the sample period 11 million and invested on average 660 per company. Ludo. You seem to be drawing inference from that as to like, what is the fraction of angel investing out there in the world, like in, in the US, and not like saying well, lots of them are individuals, yeah. they write only one check, etc. Yeah. Don't you think that here? The reason why you have so many individuals is because of this tax program. And myself, it was such a tax program. I would have picked my favorite uh, friend or company, and I would have written a check. And you say, "Oh, look, there are all these individual guys." But out, if absent this this program, probably all these individual angels wouldn't be around, right? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, the the program clearly is going to bias behavior, and it might encourage small investors. One of the things that we haven't done yet is that we can actually. Um, distinguish between who got, does and who doesn't get the uh, tax credit. And so we can see how many small investors there are with outside the tax credit program, but we haven't done that yet. So that, that's, definitely, that's definitely true. It's also true, obviously, that con other countries like the UK have similar tax credits. So there we might expect similar behavior. Um, by the way, universities, are, I mean, you know, are actually very small players in, in this game. I thought that was kind of interesting. So how much does any one investor account for in the total investment received by the company? And the main thing to realize here is venture capitalists and angel funds are quite similar. And they have significant, they, they provide a significant portion of the funding. But these angels are basically just like family and like universities, they provide a trivial fraction. Any one in the investor provides a trivial fraction. And we might therefore think also it's going to have a much smaller influence on the company. Um, who makes repeat investments? Who writes essentially more than one check? And here, I mean, we were quite surprised. Only 20% of these angels write a second check into the same company. And that you know, compares, I mean, even the VCs may not write a second check, but um, you know, more than half the time they do write a second check into the company. Um, we don't find that behavior among angels. So we can think of them as having very shallow pockets, essentially. Um, who invests in multiple companies? Very similar. Who's actually a sort of an investor as opposed to just a one-time uh, writing in check? 
basically angels behave just like family. Um, uh, yeah, universities are different because there's so few universities, so they all have a portfolio. Outcomes. We're, we're going to study this later again, but um, what do we find? We find, consistent with the prior literature, that on average, venture capitalists have a better exit performance. Now, ideally, we want to measure returns to investment. That turns out to be almost impossible in the venture capital, well, very difficult in the venture capital industry because uh, nobody gives you the right data. Um, and it's extremely difficult to find accurate data. It's basically close to impossible in the angel industry. I'm going to show you a couple of numbers, but um, what we can measure is how did their companies have a successful exit? Did it get acquired? Did it have an IPO? We find that IPO and ex um, exit rates are higher in the VCs, and then they're very similar across <coughs> the angel categories. Mark? This is a naive question, I mean, the widow's question too. It seems odd to me that you have roughly the same proportion of IPOs across all these extremely heterogeneous kinds of, of investors. You know, the argument would be, so one argument would be that some kinds of investors are better able to see high quality enterprises or ventures, yeah. and that you, it, it seems like you would expect differentials across this extremely heterogeneous set of sources of funding, yet they're roughly all 7 or 8% except for VCs, a whopping 11%. Yeah. It just, just seems odd to me. Is that too naive or? So, I mean, I guess two things. First, interestingly enough, if you look at the numbers, universities have the lowest with 5%. Um, and VCs are twice, you know, 11% more than, than twice that. IPO rates over the period that we're going to study are extremely low. And to make it slightly worse, um, uh, most of these IPOs are on Canada's second tier market. So, Canada has a um, TSX venture market, which is a stock market, so it is an IPO, but it's not the NASDAQ that you know, um, um, we dream of. So basically, we're looking at rare events. And for, you know, for the purpose of, of the analysis, we typically tend to take acquisitions and IPOs together now just because IPOs are so rare. So are they, are they rare events and that they're random across them? Are well, they? I mean, you know, we, we've run other regressions. I'm, I have them in the paper. And you do find significant effects for venture capital. So you do find higher exit rates for venture capital. Hiram. If you, as this is obviously weighted by, by incidents, but I mean, if you had it by valuation, what would it look like? There's no way of knowing because we don't have the valuations. So you, you, you have the valuations for IPOs, obviously. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Um, yeah, we have it. We didn't look at it because there's so few. But. Um, Definitely, yeah. I mean, you, you, I mean, I can tell you from other work, typically you, you find the same pattern, which is that the valuations of the venture capital-backed ones are higher than, than the other ones. So we may be understating here because we're just counting one versus zero as opposed to the actual valuation at IPO. And then for acquisitions, we typically don't have it because they don't disclose it. That's the big problem. Yeah? This shows that um, VCs have a more disciplined approach <coughs> to investing and are probably more successful in monetizing their um, investment. Is this something that the angel crowd are likely to evolve towards? Oh, yes, definitely. Um, I mean, you know, we have to be careful with this. And I mean, I'll just give you a two-minute overview. There is a very large part of the venture, a, a significant literature among venture capital researchers which have tried to understand drivers of performance and have compared venture capital with angels and different types of venture capital. Within all of this analysis, there always is a huge problem of disentangling selection and treatment effects. So basically, you've got a venture capitalist who may have some private information and may pick certain types of deals, and that's a selection effect. It's not that they're particularly better. They just pick more promising companies and maybe pay for that versus an angel who's maybe looking in a different pool of companies and therefore picks more risky deals, fewer of which succeed. So even if we find these differences, we should not infer that they are better. We don't know that. Um, um, and then, but there could be treatment effects. And in, in prior research, we've looked very hard at sort of finding evidence of whether there is something that the venture capitalists do to actually um, improve the performance. Um, I'll just tell you about one paper very briefly where we did this study and we went into the details of 
Silicon Valley companies, and we looked at the angel versus the venture capital backed one, and we found very significant differences in the way that they restructured management teams. And so we found a lot more CEO changes in venture capital by companies, and that was one of the explanations for their higher performance. So, you know, there, whether the angels want to do this or they just don't want to play that game, I think is an open issue. Great. I love questions. That makes it much more lively. Yes? Where in your experience does uh, most of the uh, venture capital data come from? So all my data today is from British Columbia. No, I understand that, but in general. In general. When we try to uh, chart the venture capital landscape. Yes. And for venture capital investors, where, where in your experience does most of the data come from? Well, I mean, the, the, the largest venture capital market accounting for approximately half of the world market is the US. The most, uh, the most reliable source is probably Thomson One, um, which is good for, uh, pretty good for North America just about okay for Europe and terrible for the rest of the world. Um, and then Where there's... Do they get their data? Sorry? Where do they get their data? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll happily give you the details in a, in a private conversation. They basically contact the investors. And then there's another venture, um, venture source which is trying to go directly to the companies. I don't think so, actually. I think, I think that they lift them mostly from uh, cap tables, uh, from uh, public pension funds. Um, pension funds have to list every single investor that is uh, in... It's more complicated. It is... It, it I no, no, no. I mean, but, but the, the majority of the data that Thomson One gets is directly from the GPs. Have you They're looked at the pension, pension funds publications? Yes, 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 yes. I'm familiar with them. I think you'll find a lot of information there on both venture capital and angel investors. Um, unfortunately, well, I mean, Capital IQ... Um, uses some of that data and gathers some of that data. But no, unfortunately, we do not get the data. Um, the pension funds sometimes have information about venture capital funds, but going down to the level of the individual company, which is what we need here, is never, I mean, I've, with the exception of one Texas fund, which did it for a while, they basically don't do they that. They have to, by law, they have to publish the entire cap table, so every single shareholder that ever put money into the company. Okay. To Let, let's talk afterwards. I think um, it's best we leave this for a separate conversation. Okay. Yeah, there are differences across countries, too. Um, anyway, the question that everybody always wants is what's the return to angel investing? And here I... I took the chicken strategy, which is I said, I'm not going to write this paper, but I had a very obstinate PhD student who wrote the paper, and so I don't have to vouch for the accuracy of it. And in fact, we know that this data is extremely unreliable, and we made many heroic assumptions. But I'll give you the bottom line, and it's basically probably what you expected. It's not good. So the median return we found is actually at zero, and the, the mean return at 10% um, IRR. So that's in line with what other people have found or speculated. But um, it's probably slightly better than venture capital, but not a lot better either. So um, you know, returns are probably bad and definitely not well measured. Question? Is including tax advantages or not? No, this is net of tax. Net of tax. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is this all angel activity, uh, farms, individuals, or just Yes, and we, I mean, he broke it down by the, you know, by the, surprisingly, we, we thought we would find at least in the, in the variation between the more sophisticated, less sophisticated angel funds, we would find big differences, and we didn't. The only big differences we found were, interestingly enough, regional, where basically the metropolitan angels, the, the angels that lived essentially in the Vancouver area, did much better than the investors in the outlying areas, although the companies in Vancouver didn't do better. So it was the sophistication of the investors, not the companies. That, w that was one of the main findings that um, Dan found in his study. Great. OK, so let's do a little interesting aside. Let's do something different for a while. We're at Oxford. And this university has been around for a long time. And I'm not the first one to study angels. This has been studied for centuries. So here's an old medieval debate that was discussed at Oxford at length, and it is, what is the gender of angels? <laughs> I'm sure you're all familiar with that. 
Well, the kind of evidence that they used at the time, I think, was inconclusive. Um, so they, they didn't really find a precise answer to it. I have an answer to it. 30%. 30% of the angels are female in our study. We were amazed, actually, by that. Um, some people might consider it low, but probably a lot of people would consider it actually reasonably high. Um, we're still working on this. This is definitely work in progress. Um, two comments before I get the question. First, the unknown is not that they don't know their gender. We don't know their gender. Um, we're inferring gender on the basis of the first names. And so if you called Chris, then we don't know. If you called TJ, we don't know. Um, and the second thing is, and this is a step in the data we haven't done yet, we suspect that because of the taxes, there is um, quite a bit of um, spousal. Um, spousal tax credits, where you know both the people in the family can get the tax credit. We don't know who's the active and who's the passive, whether they're both active investors, but we, we certainly want to disentangle this a little bit further to see how much of this is accounted by um, um, you know, spouses. Question? Yeah, it was related to that point I was going to say, you, 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 it may be under the name of a male, but it's female calling the shots and, and vice versa. So there was a similar problem in Terry O'Dean research and where he solved that by, was by looking at marital status and then looking at single male and single females versus uh, married people, right? And then you would disentangle and you would have a precise yeah. estimation. Yeah, yeah. And we're, we're going to have imperfect data because we're not going to, nowhere in the documentation do we know their marital status. We can only identify families on basis of addresses and last names. So that's, that's going to be the limitations. Harem. Do you, have, do you have any data on, on what the composition of ownership was of the firms? They, so was it, are women more likely to invest in, in firms that are run or, or, or owned by women? Or? Oh, we, we should do that. I mean, I can tell you other studies have found that. You know, that's a very common pattern in, in the literature. We've got assortative matching between investors <coughs> and gender of investors and gender of entrepreneurs. But we, we haven't looked at it here. Um, that'll, be, that'll be definitely worth um, checking out. Um, so what about investments amount? Um, slightly, but not hugely small. Uh, you know, males have slightly higher, but not hugely am um, larger amounts of investing. Um, and um, I think some people will, will find this a pleasing result. We find absolutely no difference in performance. Um, it's, you know, they're basically virtually identical. So no difference in outcomes between uh, male and female investors. OK. This was the fun part. Now I'm going to sort of roll up my sleeves and try to do some deeper analysis. Well, we're going to use this setting to um, try to understand something about the interactions between angels and venture capital. Why is this an interesting question? Well, the picture I showed you at the beginning sort of gives you this very nice, cohesive world where there are sort of these stepping stones and you go from one type of investor to the other. Well, that's very consistent, say, with uh, Mark Andreessen's quote here, to get to the best introductions to A-stage venture capitalists, what you really should do is you should work through the seed investors, meaning angel investors. So, you know, Mark Andreessen seems to believe in the stepping stone logic. You first go to the angels, then to the venture capitalists. That's what Google did. That's what Facebook did. This is sort of the received wisdom. I've seen many consultants essentially showing you that graph. But it's not the only opinion out there. So the conventional view is the stepping stone. Here's Dave McLure. And for those of you who know Dave, this was, I, I had looked at many of his quotes, and this is the one that needed the least editing. Uh, <laughs> it's all about VCs failing and failing to return capital and being idiots. VCs are stupid. They are absolutely stupid. And <laughs> so he's basically made a career as an angel of convincing the world that angels are the way to go and that you should never take your money from a venture capitalist because they are, well, you know. Um, maybe a slightly more sophisticated uh, opinion on this, Michael Arrington from TechCrunch says, you pick the wrong investor and you've closed the door on others. You'll never know it, but it will, but you know, you never know it, but it will happen to you. So if you take one investor, game over with the other. So that's a very different understanding of the relationship between angels and VCs, um, where basically we're thinking of them as parallel universes. We're thinking of them as you're making a choice. You're either going to go into a venture capital realm or you're going to go into an angel realm. Maybe you're not going to have as much money because we know that they're more constrained. So maybe you're going to build a slightly different company and maybe you're going to exit earlier. 
But the, you know, this, it's a very different view of how angels and, and venture capitalists interact with each other. Joe? Do you have uh, the data on the exit size and the IPO size for companies that go through either of these tracks? Yeah, so um, we, we haven't analyzed it a lot yet. So, you know, we should do that. I think that's definitely one of the to-do um, insights from today. So, how do we think about this? Um, now I want to give you just a flavor of the way I work as a researcher. Is Personally, I'm a big fan of actually doing theory. And so when I started to think about these, I actually began by building a mathematical theoretical model of the interactions between angels and venture capitalists. And um, I'm happy to report that paper is now forthcoming. And it's a theory on its own. And so it's not going to be exactly connected to the data I'm going to show you. But I just want to give you the flavor of what this theory looks like. So the way we're going to look at this, we're going to have a set of entrepreneurs. And in this model, they're just going to start with angels. You don't have to model it this way, but this is the way we chose it. And um, for those who are interested, we're using a search market model because we want to model imperfect competition. It's going to be a lot, a lot of the interest is going to be um, on imperfect competition. In particular, we're going to model a second market, a venture capital market, as imperfectly competitive. Angels, I mean, you know, finance the first stage if the company is still alive and is doing well, they can go to the venture capital market or they can take some alternative route. And, you know, we, we didn't sort of model all of the possibilities. Obviously, they can fail. They can do an early exit. You can also think of this as continuing a little bit longer with angel financing. So here we would sort of have a, a, a story of angels and VCs being substitutes. We're going to this way. Here we have a story of complements. What we do in the theory is we basically look at endogenously figuring out what are the valuations, what are the profits that, aren't, that are going to be retained by a three-party bargaining game. We have the entrepreneur, we have the angel, we have the venture capitalist. Some people in the room may have sat through these negotiations. They are complex. Typically, not, not always, but typically the angels cannot provide all the money. Let's just say they're in a fairly weak bargaining position. Venture capitalist has an incentive to dilute the angels. They have some incentive to dilute the entrepreneurs as well, but maybe not as much because they really still need the entrepreneur to build a company. But they don't need the angels because they're out of money. And unless you're thinking about long-term relationships and all of these other nice things, you have a strong economic incentive to put a low valuation on the company, possibly upping the stock, op uh, stock option pool. This is a real problem. This has been written about um, in, in, in the popular press. So I, I basically tried to do, model this in a game theoretic way. And the insights that you get is this problem, and I'm going to call it a holder problem, it's, a not, it's maybe not the perfect term, but let me just call it the holder problem. The holder problem is the angel invested early, comes into the venture capital stage, has no power because doesn't have the money, isn't really needed, is being held up by the venture capitalists. We're modeling that holder problem by trying to look at, well, what are the alternatives? The alternatives are going to be determined by sort of two factors. One is the level of competition in the venture capital market. If you get a first venture capitalist who's offering you a terribly low valuation, but you're in a very competitive environment, you will find another venture capitalist who's eager to take the deal at a higher valuation. And so comp competition in the venture capital market protects you from that whole that problem. But then there's a set of essentially contractual and legal details that basically say how difficult is it for the venture capitalist to structure a deal with the entrepreneur that leaves the angel aside. And so there are many ways of thinking about that. And in, the, in the theory, we, we, we sort of give it a very specific but maybe simple, uh, simple shape. And what we can show is the better the legal protection of the angel investor, the less we have a problem. The more 
basically um, the angel is exposed either through poor legal system or say poor contracts uh, or lack of competition, the more we have a problem in the angel capital market. So what we're getting out of this is we're getting a pretty rich analysis that says the structure of the venture capital market is going to determine whether we think of angels or venture capitalists as substitutes or complements. Whether we're living in a world of stepping stones or we're living in a world of parallel universes is in this model going to be determined in large parts by the structure of the venture capital market. It's obviously also determined by the sophistication of the angels. To what extent are the angels able to hold their strength when negotiating with a venture capitalist? Um, that's the key insight from the theory. Questions? Yes? Um, on um, dilution, you seem to indicate that that is necessarily a bad thing. But I would imagine it's a bad thing only if it's done below fair market value. As long as it's done fair market value or above, it's not a bad thing. Sure. Sure, sure, sure. And we can, in the theory, we can actually define these things with great precision. Yeah? So how do you deal with the endogeneity problem between the thickness of the venture capital market and the quality of the firms, right? So one would argue that where you have better firms, Boston or Silicon Valley, you're going to have thicker VC markets, right? Yeah. And so and where you're in some place like, I don't know, Minneapolis or something, you're going to have very thin VC markets. And so the bargaining power is going to be different. So. Yeah. You know, how do you deal with, I mean, how do you, is, where in your theory does that come into play? Yeah. I mean, you know, the quick answer is the theory, if you know search models, you actually, you have to use a couple of assumptions in, in search model. One of is homogeneous M types. And so you literally can't, the, the mathematics of, of it makes it incredibly difficult. So the only way we can think about in the theory is to do a comparative static analysis of saying, take one set of parameters for Boston, take one set of parameters for Minnesota, how does the market differ? Um, and there, no, but I mean, if you just, if, if I sort of just step out of my pure theory role and just think about it more broadly, you would get self-reinforcing dynamics, right? So the larger market, the more competitive market is also gonna attract the higher quality entrepreneurs. And so in that market, you would expect that this complement is going to work out very well, leaving the Minnesota guys in an equilibrium with strong substitutes, right? Now, this is really interesting insight because it's going to sort of affect a little bit of my empirical analysis where we're going to say, I'm going to find a certain result of substitutes in British Columbia. I have no idea whether that result is true in Silicon Valley. You know, we've just identified a theoretical reason why it may very well be different in Silicon Valley. Now, there are only, you know, two or three of these really and, you know, hops that have those positive dynamics, but we don't know. The quotes that I'm getting from are also people from Silicon Valley, so they clearly in Silicon Valley people believe both stories too. Yes? I follow um, your PhD chart about the 10% mean return on angel markets, but you say it's slightly better than VC market. If I apply that to this model, then the introduction of the angel market actually, as a pre-selector of ventures, is actually creaming up and much of getting a higher return. So actually pre-selecting before feeding the rest to the VC market, which raises for me the question is, so what is really the inefficiency between the VC market and the entrepreneur, which has actually triggered that the angel market has suddenly become half of the overall piece. And right. one of the suggest suggestions I would have is there's a trust relationship, which is broken between VC and entrepreneurs. What do you think about that? Lots of comments to make. When first, in principle, this construct is not inefficient because here we've got actually specialization. So if you think of the history of the venture capital industry, it used to be just a bunch of generalist funds, ARD or um, 3I in England. And then over you know, the last 30, 40, de um, de you know, three or four decades, venture capitalists have become specialized. They've become specialized by industry, by stage. Now what we've seen in the last 10 years is a further institutional spe um, specialization with venture capital essentially going into later stage markets and the early stage market being filled by angels, accelerators, crowdfunding, and so on. None of that by itself suggests there's any inefficiency that sort of, you know, 
um, and that, that's the way we, we think of specialization in economics, that's good. However, I do think that there is, and what we show in this theory is that there can be a real friction here because of this holder problem. And then the answer is about relationships and trust. Yes, I mean, there are interesting solutions that I have seen in the marketplace. I'm going to go slightly beyond my research now, but interesting solutions where venture capital funds are aware of this problem and have gone out and built either just informal networks and relationships or in some cases have built funds in which they are co-investing with angel funds or in some cases angels that are allowed to invest in a sidecar fund of the venture capitalists in order to essentially create a synergistic environment in which this passing over of the baton actually works. I think we still haven't figured out how to do this well but you know, if, if we need some kind of cross-fund holding or something to make this transition more, more, more efficient, then that's probably a good idea. All right. But Thomas, isn't that more a sectoral story? So I mean, the digital space, right? You don't need a lot of money anymore. I mean, VCs were getting crowded out. So I mean, they had no choice but to kind of, you know, sort of pop up these kind of quick $250,000, you know, no questions asked funds, right? <laughs> that were competing with the angel funds because they were basically weren't getting access to a lot of the what were good deals. So there are lots of interesting stories here. Um, and we're, go we're going to get carried away for a moment, and I'll come back to the main. Um, some of the fans of the essentially, let's call it an early exit movement, which is you start with angel investing, you get a couple of rounds of angel investing, and you're not trying to build or scale a company to a very large scale. You sell early. This has worked extremely well in some sectors, and it's worked very well in sort of um, media, um, obviously um, Web Point 2.0, and you know some of those, some of those industries, yeah, you know, as Hiram said. Now, you think on the other hand of you know clean tech or um, life sciences, we're gonna ha we're not gonna be able to do these early exits. We need to first prove a lot more before there's any acquisition candidate, and then you know we need the venture capital. So to what extent? you know, we're going to choose those two models is going to be driven um, by industry. There's also a question that I think is harder, which is, has the fact that this system here isn't working so well led entrepreneurs to basically focus on businesses that are not as ambitious? This is one of the problems that, you know, some people are arguing today is we've created a system in which we're great at encouraging entrepreneurs to create little things that they're selling early, but nobody knows how to build companies that actually scale. And so there's a whole scale-up movement. Our dean has been outspoken on this, and there are other people who basically have argued that this is a big problem. And so maybe the answer is part finance and part, part is something else in finance, obviously. Yes? Um, in your research, did you look into the state at which the entrepreneurs or the angels actually lose control of the company? Yeah, so not in this paper, but in, in previous rounds, I mean, we basically find that the, um, the angels don't take as much control to begin with. Sorry? No board seats. Um, fewer board seats, fewer contractual clauses that um, give them control, and then what we saw, especially fewer CEO turnovers. there are ways in which angels are seeking to get leverage. Um, and so some of the results I have actually speak to that. So let me now move on. And so I think I've sort of, uh, the, key, the key insight from the theory, as far as I was concerned, supplements and compliments, depends on market structure. Now, we're not going to test that explicitly, but I think it's a useful background to have for the empirical analysis. Oops, here's a jump. Here's a jump. So. I am going to jump straight into the regression analysis now. Um, I haven't had the time to form, you know, define all the variables carefully and the sample. If I was doing an academic seminar, I would spend 15, 20 minutes on doing that. Today, I'm just going to jump sort of straight into the results. So here is a set of regressions where we're going to use our data. Let me see if this thing works. Yes. And we're going to try to figure out 
what is, we're going to look at companies on a round by round basis and we're going to ask, do you get angel financing in this particular round? Do you get venture capital or do you get some kind of other mon money? Later on, we're going to break them out into smaller categories, but this three-way categorization is quite useful. We're going to ask that, um, sometimes we're going to ask just, do you get angel, yes or no? Or we're going to ask how much angel money, how much venture capital money we get. It doesn't matter, the results are extremely similar. But we're going to ask, uh, run a simple regression where we're going to say, whether you get angel funding or not is going to be a function of what you had before and a whole large number of controls that I'm not showing you. But, you know, we're going to control for industry because there's things that Hiram said. We're going to control for calendar time. We're going to control for company age. We're going to control for the amount of money that you had in the previous rounds, how long the last round was ago, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of things that we're going to control for. We also recognize that there are things that we don't see. We don't see the strategy of the company. We don't see the quality of the manager or the ambition of the manager. And we're going to talk about unobservables later. Is this the BC data still? This is still the BC data. Yeah, this is the BC data, exactly. So what are we finding here? Um, the first thing I want to show you is that on the main diagonal, these are three different regressions, but on the main diagonal, I've used the color green to indicate a positive and highly significant coefficient. That says, if I've received more angel financing in the past, I am more likely to get more angel financing. Now, this could be for two reasons. One is it could be that my old angels are putting in more money, or it could be that I'm getting new angels. We deliberately throw out all the old investors. So we're not looking at repeat investments. We're only interested in your new investors' money, and we're still finding this result. That's why it's not a trivial result. It says, if I'm, or if I'm getting a certain type of financing, I'm likely to get more of it, although from different investors. Now, on the off diagonal, we find a negative coefficient. And this is, is, this is the basic this is the basis for, for me saying angels and VCs look like substitutes. What's the idea is if I received more prior venture cap oops, if I received more prior venture capital funding, I am less likely to get angel. This one is maybe still relatively intuitive. You might think the company has sort of outgrown angels, but we're also finding it the other way around. If I had more angel money, um, I'm less likely to get venture capital. So it looks like companies stay within their types. Um, yes, Mark? I just want to that, you had a few slides ago, you had shown us that visual that said there's angels and there's VCs, and there's, they potentially have a linear relationship, that they're a, a step sum. You're talking yeah, step sum. Yeah, seven, yeah. What would that look like in these results, or would you ever see it? In other words, yeah. I'm thinking you probably have these controls, Brown, age of the firm, whatever, blah, blah, blah. All of that. And so what's gonna, what would a prediction that says, when do they tip? When do they go from one to the other? Did you run those models at all? And um, we try to look, um, we try to sort of look whether we can find tipping points or whether these things change with the age of the company. Um, we, we didn't find much. We didn't find much. Um, but what would a complements relationship look like? It would have a green coefficient, a positive one. That is the, that's okay. Yeah, I, I, I think this conversation too, I'm not sure the sequential model is true, right? It's the logical model or it's the standard yeah. model, but it's, there's, you can think lots of situations where particularly outside of this data set, but outside of the Western industrialized context of strong institutions, there might be many more complex pathways that don't look like that model. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's very much what we're finding. When, basically this paper is going to reject the stepping stone and we're going to some of the recent developments are all in making that more you know stronger and um, very briefly it's somewhat interesting but there is sort of also a question of how much does prior financing predict you know additional financing and there is sort of a notion of deep pockets or companies that receive more venture capital funding tend to get more on on total that's not true for the angel and the other investors um, there's, the economists in the room are going to be silently probably, but screaming and saying, very nice correlation, where's the causation? Um, that's a very important question. Here, in this regression, I have made no claims about causality, and that's important. 
to say, I'm not saying it's because you had angel investing that you're not getting venture capital. There could be two very different stories. So what are the two different stories? Let me, could I? No, I didn't do a slide for it. I'll just tell. Two different stories could be underlying the substitution pattern. One story is essentially the story that we often want to tell, which is a causal story. And it says, because I received angel financing, I was pushed away from the venture capitalists. They just wanted to keep the deal in the angel community. Or maybe they just had the right networks within the angel community. And so my company stayed in the angel community. And it was the angels and their money that led me on that path. That's a causal and investor-led story. As an economist, we're going to be keenly aware that there's a second story that is not that the investors are causing this. There are some characteristics of my company. For example, maybe I am an unambitious entrepreneur who doesn't want to scale, or I'm an entrepreneur that has a business that just doesn't fit a venture capital portfolio. And therefore, I'm in the angel community, and I continue to stay in the angel community. And it has nothing to do with the actions of the angel. It's all company-led. We would love to disentangle those two um, effects. This is a classic um, identification problem. Um, these problems are hard. And we rarely have perfect solutions. But we have a reasonable solution, I think. And the reasonable solution we have is then we're going to use the tax credits. Remember that I have data and because of the tax credits. In an ideal world, I would have had a regulator who says, today, angels, you've got a 20%, and venture capitalists say you have a 20%. Now, tomorrow, angels, I give you a 30%, and venture capitalists, you have 20%. And maybe later on, I'll switch it around. I would have random variation in the tax rates because then, in certain times, angel financing is more attractive, and other times, venture capital financing is more attractive. Unfortunately, I could not convince my regulator to do this, because there was absolutely no reason to change these rates. So I don't have the perfect instrument. I do have an instrument, though, because it turns out that these regulators love to shift money between budgets. And so what we find is that over time, they allocate more tax credits onto the angel program. They take it out of the venture capital program, and they shift these things around. And that we can observe to some extent. We can't observe it exactly. What we can observe, to be very specific, is the amount of tax credits that are actually drawn from the different programs. And there's a fair amount of variation across those. How am I going to use that variation? What I'm saying is, in certain times, there were more angel credits. and other times, there were less angel credits around. So you would think if a company was fundraising in a time when there were lots of angel credits, they're more likely to get angel financing. And in times where there was more tax credits for venture capital, they're more likely to get venture capital credits. That is the variation I'm going to use. This is an, uh, I'm going to think of it as exogenous variation. And in an academic seminar, I would spend probably 20 minutes now trying to convince you of the exogeneity. Um, I will skip that step now and basically say, we're going to try to use this as a little experiment and see for companies who happen to be rising, raising money in angel-rich times, whether they then also are less likely to become venture capital. Because if it's true that a random injection of angel money makes you go even less to the venture capitalist, then it looks like an investor-led story. Whereas if, give you, if, I, if it's all a company story, I'm a certain entrepreneur, I've got a certain path, and my company is not venture capital fundable anymore, a random injection of angel money should not change my path. That is the variation in the data we're going to use. Now, I'm in instrumental variable, we have a two-step procedure. In the first step, we're trying to figure out whether our tax credits actually predict what we think they should predict, which is... Um, whether I'm raising more money from angels or VCs. And the answer there is very clear. I am raising more angel money. Um, sorry, if the tax credits for venture capital go up, I am, we see less fundraising from angels, and we see more fundraising from angels when the tax credits for angels go up. 
So it behaves the way we would think. And here we got basically the same thing, this coefficient is significant, but that doesn't really matter. We're not very good at predicting the behavior of the other investors. Well, guess what? They don't get tax credits. Most of these are not in the tax credit program. And so, you know, there's, a li there's some effect here, but especially these programs, they don't affect them. And that, you know, jointly, this is insignificant, the F-test. Yes? Isn't it possible to find Q by, you know, the kind of venture capital funds that would be active in that region, and then you know their investment criteria, because they're probably publicly available. You could look at companies that would be eligible for, according to this criteria, and the one not, right? So you may have a company, and they, they would fall within the criteria of five venture capital funds, some in none of them, and that would explain why they're only uh, funded by angels, right? To, to look at the publicly available investment criteria of these funds. It's not worth it. We could talk about it. Let's talk about it and see if there's something we can do there. Yeah? Do we have data on the company's money is invested into? Because for me, it seems it's, it's only investor-related what you are doing here. Well, most of these companies are uh, um, cash flow negative. So we do know the funding contributed and by... Industry-wise, because... These, oh yeah, I never showed you the industry. There are certain types of real estate companies which potentially may be tax-eligible and into yeah. which private investors are more likely to invest than venture capitalists and all these types of relations that yeah. somehow are uh, uh, hidden behind these, these numbers. Yeah, yeah. So, um, one is just um, in terms of explaining the, the, the econometrics, we do control for industry. So, all of our statistics sort of take uh, into account which industry you're in. Um, we do find that um, the VCs are, what we have in this program is basically high tech companies of the usual variety, so that's life sciences, um, IT, and a little bit of um, clean tech. Um, and then we also have a couple of odd industries in here, uh, most notably tourism, and that's because BC just extended their program also to tourism. And not a big surprise, the VCs don't do that. So that's entirely angel territory. There's no real estate or anything, because that's not eligible in the program. OK, anyway, so what we get um, now, and I think you know, this is sort of an interesting result, is once we use the instrumental variable, we find that a lot of effects disappear, but, no, but the most important one doesn't. So what do I mean by that? It does seem that this logic, company-led logic, explains a lot. In a sense that when, when we're only using the exogenous variations in tax credits, we're, we're not finding a strong effect. So basically, selection effects explain a large amount, but they don't if explain what I think is maybe the most important what result, which is that more angel financing leads to venture capital. Another way of putting that is if because of tax credits you receive more funding from angels, it actually was seeing you switching away even more from, um, um, to away from the venture capital community. And therefore that part does look like a causal mechanism. Um, now we're going to do a couple more things, then you know, I'll, I'll open it up, but um, when we're finding this negative relationship is it just driven by the losers? Because in a stepping stone logic, you might say, yeah, you're going to find a lot of companies that never get out of the angel world, but that's just because they're not good enough. You only get into the venture capital world if you're a high performer. And so the stepping stone should apply to the Facebook and Googles, but it shouldn't apply to all the losers, um, and there are many of them. Well, it's very hard to define what's a loser. Uh, it's very hard to measure performance at the time of financing. What I do have is the eventual outcome. I know whether the company failed or still alive or actually had a successful exit. So what we're going to do here is we're going to go through a two-step logic. Um, the first step we're going to say is under the stepping stone, it says that the better companies graduate to venture capital. So it should be that venture capital-backed companies have better performance. Well, I've kind of shown you those results before, and we redo it here, and we do find that. Second step, it has to be true that the substitutes effect is true for the low performers, but not true for the high performers. Well, when we do that test, we don't find that pattern. We don't find that this substitution pattern disappears for the high performers. So the Google-Facebook effect 
isn't in the data. We don't find that that's a systematic pattern. So basically, that's sort of you know what I think is the nail in the coffin of the stepping stone hypothesis. Um, that you know, it it just you can't explain it by just saying oh only the good ones graduate to venture capital. That's not true either. Okay, the one more thing we do in the paper is we decompose the angels into three categories, and then we also decompose the venture capitalists into different categories and the others. <coughs> um, and I, I just gave you an extract because it's a huge table. But we basically, I've come up with better names. I didn't put them in here yet. We're going to distinguish three types of angels. One that I'm going to call a casual angel, and that's essentially an angel who makes one investment, one company. Maybe one or two checks in the company, but just one company. Then we're going to call the serial angel those who actually make more than one investment. Some of them is 10, some of them is, is not quite as much, but they're obviously different in the sense that they, the person who makes one angel investment probably doesn't think of him or herself as an angel investor. It's probably somebody who helped out a friend or something like that, just got intrigued ones. The person who's writing two, you know, checks to two or three or four companies, that starts to look like an angel investor who's actually doing it more seriously. And then we've got the angel funds, which are aggregating angels. So the question is, are we going to have this substitution pattern in the same way for these three types of angels? And so I just want to share those results with you. I think they're quite interesting. Um, on the main diagonal, we've got the usual thing. Let's, little aside, I find this very amusing, but um, we've broken down the venture capitalists themselves. And we ask, is there a sort of a positive pattern within the venture capital community? The answer is yes, except for this one. If you've received more money from the government venture capitalist, that doesn't impress the privates. Uh, which, if you know the, the, the market, um, you might find that funny. I find it funny. Um, and this isn't really working. OK, this is uh, an interesting result. So we, we tend to find it. We tend to find this substitutes result. We find to find this negative pattern. When we look hard, we're not finding it for the serial angels. So it's not you know, this thing that if you've got more money from uh, an angel, then you're sort of essentially not going into the venture capital. We're not finding it for the serial angels. Now, we're not finding a significant effect. The, the coefficient is actually positive in general. But so the substitution pattern isn't really true for the more sophisticated angels. It is very much true for the casual angels. And somewhat surprising, um, it is also true for the angel funds. So you might have thought that you know, serial angels and angel funds are both more deep-pocketed angels, people who could, in principle, finance the company. But we're actually finding different patterns. Serial angels maybe work better with the venture capital community. Angel funds position themselves more as a substitute. To us, that was a surprising result, because there's not even a big size difference. We've seen that before. There isn't really a big size difference between them, but they do behave differently. Yes? This is just correlations, right? Yeah, yeah. This is, again, the, the correlations. Mm -hmm. Not then just way too much um, to, because causation, for sure, cannot come from these correlations. Right. But in fact, most of the numbers from this table and the previous tables are really low in terms of the explained um, variation or whatever. It's really, really low to base any conclusions upon. Yeah, so a so couple of things. First, you can't interpret these coefficients in a simple way. Um, you know, the, 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 these are nonlinear regression models with nonlinear variables. So you don't think of this as a dollar term or anything um, like that. Um, the explanatory power is always low in these studies. So that's a problem that, that you know, we always have. So my, my, my view tends to be if we actually find something that's significant, probably that's quite. Well, I mean, normally, if you, if you have a hypothesis up front, and then you start to use large pieces of data, <coughs> find such numbers, then this 0.3 and maybe the 0.34, uh, they, they, they could have some meaning. But if you first run the <coughs> correlations, it doesn't say anything, in my opinion. Okay, maybe we need to explain this later. And um, these are regression models, so they're not correlation coefficient. They are 
conditional correlations, conditional on everything else that, that's controlled in the regression, the coefficients are not directly interpretable. Um, you know, we, um, we have not spent a huge amount of time thinking about the size of these effects, so I think that's something that um, um, we could do. But um, one more thing on the causation correlation, that's what I dealt with earlier on. So earlier on, when I told you the instrumental variable strategy with tax strategy, that's where we looked at um, causation. We can't do it here because we don't have enough instruments. We've got now in total seven categories and we've got three instruments so we can't identify from an econometric perspective. Maybe we'll continue that conversation afterwards, okay? Um, okay, so I'm just gonna talk, I've got a little bit of time, um, a little bit about future research. I wanted to share with you an idea of the kind of things that we can do with ANGEL um, and, and thinking about the structure of the ANGEL data. Where else, you know, is this going? Well, I think there's a lot more that I want to do with ANGELS. Um, one of them is I, I, I currently I've got a project where we're trying to understand the, um, the diversity, understand deeper the diversity within the ANGEL community. So I've touched upon it here, but we really want to understand the differences in behavior. And some of it we think is quite interesting to think about the geographic distribution of angels. Where are they? Where do they invest? Um, accelerators, I'd love to get my hands on accelerator data. I do have a notion that I think it's not really an entrepreneurial finance question. I think accelerators is a great topic for entrepreneurship and understanding sort of business creation, but I think it, the, the funding part's pretty trivial. Crowdfunding is a big topic. We've got some people in the faculty that are getting quite interested in this. Um, I think the, the, the initial research is going to focus on essentially understanding what's happening on the crowdfunding platforms themselves. The kind of research I like doing would basically suggest uh, maybe some of the more interesting, or some of the additional interesting questions relate to how crowdfunding interacts with the established um, uh, channels of financing. How does a crowdfunding campaign interact with raising angel capital or venture capital? I think there's some really interesting questions there and we don't have good answers on that yet. Um, and then, I mean, just I'm, um, Barclays has um, very generously funded a postdoc where we're gonna be working with them on trying to think through new models of funding entrepreneurs because there's a general sense that we're just not getting it right. And so one of the ideas that we're gonna pursue there is to think about intellectual property as collateral and whether there are funding mechanisms through banks who have been relatively minor players in this area as a way of you know, funding entrepreneurs. So that's kind of a, 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 just to give you a flavor of the kind of research ideas that I'm interested in. The other thing I'm very passionate about is public policy. Um, basically, I've told you already about a little bit about my research on government venture capital. And frankly, the interesting thing uh, is not that we wrote this paper. The interesting thing is that we're, we're the first ones in the profession to do this, which just puzzled me. And that's why we wrote the paper, and still there are very few studies. And it's puzzling because there's a huge amount of government support that went into financing of um, venture capital, um, angels, tax credits. And in the last five to 10 years, it's gone up, and you know, jurisdiction after jurisdiction have introduced a program. So what's the kind of research we can do there? One is just policy evaluation. Um, that's sort of, does the program work? And there's a a set of people who have begun to do this, you, you know, I think that, that that's very important. I'm, I also would like to go further and think a little bit more conceptually about how should we think of a government policies towards funding um, entrepreneurs. And it turns out that there's shockingly little research that's um, actually being done. So if that's something that you're interested, I'd love to talk to you more about it. I've got a few minutes left, so I, you know, want to get off the slides now and just sort of take general questions. Yes? Thank you. This is very valuable insight. Uh, uh, in your research, did, um, does your data somehow reveal how much money the entrepreneurs are putting in themselves? Yeah, we actually have some of that. Yes, yes. Um, it tends to be quite low. So if you're thinking of the um, percentage of funding, I think we're in the... One to three percent range of the oh, total okay. capital. Does that include is the, the two typical sources of funding prior to angels or yeah. entrepreneurs yeah. themselves and friends and family? 
No, not Which friends and family, actual founders. So I've, I've got another project based on this data because we, there's some riches in the data. We're actually trying to understand um, yeah, the, the, the role of funders and the new manager who come into the company and what they contribute in terms of financing. But we were shocked by how little it actually is. And um, obviously they're putting in their work, sweat equity. But in terms of financial contribution, it's quite low. Thank you. I just saw a new company uh, out called AlphaWorks, and they offer, um, the way they work is they combine crowd funding with actual venture capital rounds. Um, so the venture capitalists are allowing this crowd funding in. And I wonder how much of that is a kind of an adoption, like a PR for the startup, and how much is an adaption, uh, an adaptation, like you said, how they're having to introduce um, the sidecar model and stuff. Uh, do you think that, do you foresee a bigger blend between institutional investors and this sort of model of uh, incorporating in the crowdfunding? And uh, would you be able to comment on what you think the actual objective of it might be? I must, I, I am a little skeptical. The, the sort of version 1.0 of crowdfunding does, I, I don't think mixes well with venture capital. It creates cap tables that are incredibly long. The venture capitalists worry about the governance. They worry about lawsuits, among other things. Um, AngelList has come up with some really innovative, so I think of AngelList as version 2.0, um, where they basically aggregating the crowd into legal entities, mini LPs or mini funds or something like that. And those, I think, will be much easier to have on your cap table and then raise venture capital or even raise them simultaneously. Um, but I think that there, there's sort of been, a, at least in the initial version, there's been a bit of innocence of getting a, you know, cheap money from the crowd, but then the crowd doesn't understand that they're going to get brutally diluted. <laughs> Yeah. Does the data reveal anything about um, the relationship between the time dimension and the angel or the VC? In, and one would be the time to exit, but also I think very interesting in the time of actually what's happening post exit in terms of involvement of an angel hypothesis. You might get involved much longer in post exit than a VC company. How do, you, how do you see that time dimension play into that? Yeah, so, you know, one of the people that I, 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 one of the angel investors that I knew extremely well in, in, in Vancouver always wanted me to show in my data that angels get their money out faster. Problem is, it's not true. Um, the reason it's not true is that even though they have this model of early exit, they're not achieving the exits. In fact, their exit rates are, are very low, and so they end up holding their companies, you know, longer than they want to. Um, so that's what we know about the horizons while investing. After exit, we have almost no data. It is actually data that I would love to have, but for a different reason, because the big question there is who scales up. Um, and that's, you know, when we're looking at the acquisitions, we sometimes think it's a problem that if we sell a company, then you know, they take the jobs and take them to China or to America or something. And there we really don't have the data because all of our databases stop at exit. And the moment that you get integrated and you go get bought by Google or by Siemens or whatever, we just don't know because it's a division and we have no data on that division. That's the big problem after exit. And from a public policy perspective, um, does it seem that the tax credits Yeah, the million dollar question in, in um, that's a really hard question. I would love to give you an answer, but I would need a control, control group. And unfortunately, very few policymakers are thoughtful about creating control groups. But um, they, they were clearly shifting money around between the different credits, and I assume that wasn't perfect. They weren't, the, the money in credits did change sure. a little bit. 
it's not a perfect, it's not a control group, but it, it should yeah. be So in my first stage regression, for example, I showed more tax credit is associated with more investment. So we see the direct response. The problem, the, the really deep problem that you put your finger on is how much of that is a creation versus a reallocation effect. And we need control groups for that. <laughs> we really need control groups. Ideally, we want randomized experiments. That's really hard. But at the minimum, we need control groups. And when we did the report for the, for the BC government, we pointed out that they didn't have a control group, but they never did anything about it. And so I couldn't either. Um, are there individual angels or BCs in the data that stand out from a performance perspective? Why? Yeah, in all of those, in all of that data, you always have enormous skew. And so you always have basically lots of losers and a couple of winners. That's true in the venture capital data, that's true in the angel data, um, and it, it fundamentally affects the way we think about building businesses. But could it be then that the whole you know, um, difference in return between angels and VCs actually are just because That's definitely true. That's why I don't have a lot of faith in any of the returns data. One of the be benefits of just using the simpler measure, did you have an exit or not, actually takes you away from that skew. So it, it's bad because we're not measuring the returns as precisely, but it also gives us maybe away from that problem. Maybe this is a naive question. Uh, you talked about going from the past world where you had entrepreneur VC exit to this new world with it and the new entrance in it. Um, how much of that is just uh, articulating stuff that was already happening? So in the old world, you had entrepreneurs, you had people investing in those companies, we just didn't call them angels. And, and so how much is just, you're just describing something that's always happened, as opposed to talking about something that's new? I wish I knew. I think it's a bit of both. That's my, my, my own um, interpretation. Clearly, angel investing exists for decades and centuries. Um, so there's nothing new about angel investing. Accelerators and crowd funds are truly new. We know that. Um, I do think, but I have no proof, that um, angel investing is on the rise. Within my data, I can show it a little bit, in the sense that I can show you that the, over time, the fraction of angel goes up. Um, but how much of that is truly new versus we're learning about it and we didn't know about it before? Really hard question to answer. I suppose the reason you ask the question, to ask the question is if, if it's always been there, then the notion that angel, you know, if I had angel investments, it precludes me from venture capital investment. But, you know, it's kind of a, which is sort of what your, uh, your data showed. It's, uh, <coughs> It's something that's always been. Oh, yeah. As opposed yeah. to a, the introduction of angel funds or angel investors causing that problem. Yeah, yeah. And in mind the thing, when we did our regressions, we actually looked at whether our effects changed over time. We found no effects. These effects were very stable over time. Now we're looking at the short time, time horizon. Did you look at debt fin finance uh, in the two different fields? A difference between them? We didn't. That's a simple answer. We have a little bit of data. It's relatively minor compared to the equity component, and we haven't really spent time looking at it. Our data is not as good for that. Is there anything in the um, data to help explain <coughs> between angels and VCs why projects fail? So something that could help explain whether it's project management for the wrong key people or yeah, you need a different data design approach. I mean, these are questions that, you know, in the business school, some of us really care about these questions. And what I'm doing, you know, the kind of data and administrative data that I get is very good about sort of understanding patterns and cross-company, cross-investor effects. The question you're asking is really a within-company effect. And so you need a different study design where you basically need companies to sign up to provide in inside company information. I've done that 15 years ago in Silicon Valley, and I only did it because I had some colleagues who were um, leading the project. It's extremely intensive work to do that. Just one last one is, um, what is the, uh, do you know from the data what the social impact is of, of 
that series in terms of, for example, how much employment has been created yeah. through, through this, which is, I think, another interesting dimension compared to just um, the profit of return. So that's what the government report wanted us to do. And so we did a whole analysis on job creation. And it turns out that the government cared most whether they got the, um, a tax dollar back for every tax dollar they invested. <laughs> and so these calculations make no sense because we're comparing apples and oranges. But that was actually the question that they thought was the most relevant. OK. I, I have an eye on the clock. The, be the best sign of a good talk is if one has to break it off because there's still questions in the room. So, um, I'm, but I'm just mindful of time and people needing to get away. So, so break it off. Thanks again very much, Thomas. Yeah. Yeah.